Welcome everyone and uh, thank you for your interest in this uh, very popular seminar. Today's event is brought to you by the Centre for Physical Activity and Nutrition Research at Deakin University, uh, Baker IDI and the Obesity Policy Coalition. My name is Kylie Ball, I'm from the Centre for Physical Activity and Nutrition Research or CPAN and it's my pleasure to be hosting uh, this seminar today. For those of you who are aware of CPAN, we're a multidisciplinary research centre recognised internationally for our expertise in physical activity, nutrition, sedentary behaviour and obesity prevention. We present seminars regularly to share our research in these areas and to foster collaboration uh, opportunities. So today's seminar features Dr Karina Hawkes, who's the Head of Policy and Public Affairs with the World Cancer Research Fund International. And Karina also has affiliations with the Centre for Food Policy in London and the Leverhulme Centre for Integrated Research into Agriculture and Health. Karina has worked internationally for 15 years, analysing and promoting food system and food policy solutions for better nutrition, healthier eating and improved public health. She's been active in research and advocacy, in advising governments and international agencies and in publishing widely in the public health nutrition and food policy literature. I'm particularly excited about Karina's presentation today, having led a research program um, coincidentally over the last 15 years also, focused on reducing inequities in unhealthy eating and uh, obesity. And having followed Karina's work in this field over the years, I'm really excited to hear about some of the international advances in this area. Today, Karina will speak on how policy can support the provision of healthy food in communities with some lessons learned from a, a global perspective. And the presentation will run for 45 minutes, which will allow uh, about 15 minutes for questions at the end. But thank you, Karina. Great, thank you very much indeed for that uh, introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thanks very much for um, asking me to uh, give this seminar here today. I've been having a wonderful time in Melbourne uh, the last few days um, and uh, it's really fantastic to, to be here. So um, I'm going to be talking around uh, how can policy support the provision of healthy diets in communities. And um, thank you. And I just wanted to start by why ask this question at all? Why look at this particular policy area? And I think the first one is the one that we think about most often, which is that we are aware that there are communities, there are people who have barriers to healthy food access. And so this happily, happy family here on the left, um, they really are a family who would want to eat fruits and vegetables, they would want to eat healthy diets and healthy foods, but it's not available, it's not affordable, it's not culturally acceptable. And so you have policies that can help them overcome those barriers to meeting their demand. And some people talk about this in terms of food security and addressing inequalities. Um, others talk about making healthy choices, the easy choices. But the other side of this, of course, is that the food environment where we live influences what we eat. So if that family, if the kids in that family have been brought up with a, an environment, a neighbourhood environment, a community environment in which fruits and vegetables are plenty, where there's retailers which sell all kinds of healthy foods, they're more likely, because they've been modelled and exposed to it, to learn to like these kinds of healthy foods and diets. Uh, it means that if people are surrounded by an unhealthy food environment, that means they'll learn to like the unhealthy foods that are around them. And the third reason for looking at this is because when you're looking at retailing, when you're looking at our community food environment, you are talking fundamentally about an economic process. That the retail um, system and the underlying food system to that is an economic driver. So this is a bit different to the situation of when in schools, where you're talking about very specific settings um, and very much about supporting children in those schools to something which is fundamentally around us, all of us, every day and part of our food economy. And the fourth reason is that despite this, there's a relatively speaking a policy, um, a policy gap. So at WCF International we have our nourishing framework, many of you will be familiar with that, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but it includes the 10 areas which we think um, uh, where government needs to be taking action in those 10 areas. So that's in food environments, that's in food systems, and that's in behaviour change. So we have our 10 areas. 
and we pull together in those 10 areas the policy actions that have been taken around the world. And when you look at one aspect of our food environment, which is what's available in schools and workplaces and so on, there's a lot of actions at both the national and state kind of provincial level. A lot of actions. And this is an example of our, of our database here, um, where you can see there are actions on the left about promoting fruits and vegetables in the schools, but there's also actions about trying to keep the, the bad stuff out at um, of school meals and in canteens and so on. I should say that Australia does well here because it's always, in, with an A, it's always at the top. Uh, uh, we are actually working now to, to in introduce some functionality into our database to in improve um, how easy it is to use. But actually then when you go and look at what's actually happening in the retail space, in the community space, um, where we have 71 actions in nourishing on schools, etc., we only have 16 actions on retail. Now, we don't claim to be comprehensive, and some of the reasons that we've only got 16 is because a lot of these initiatives are at the community level. They're not national initiatives, they're not even state or provincial, whatever the, uh, the, the region is called, level. They're often at the community level, so they're harder to find out information about. But I know from experience of talking to policymakers from countries around the world, including at the local level, that there are definitely less actions in this space. And the H piece, the harness the food system, harness the food supply, is also part of this, because that's what can underpin these kind of retail changes at retail level. We only have a handful of actions which are implemented specifically to promote healthy eating. So there's really a policy gap here. However, there are policies that have been implemented around the world, and I'm going to take, take you through some of those that are in our nourishing database as well as a, a couple of other ones as well. Now, I'm, I'm talk, going to talk about five main areas of policy action internationally. That's not to say that on other areas where um, action has been taken, uh, vending machines, uh, for example, other things that have been done within stores. But what I've focused on is what has been done at the policy level um, around the world. And I think I, I found kind of categorised five areas of action that have been taken on retail uh, food provision in communities. The first is incentives for, for, st for st um, stores, for kind of healthy food stores to locate in underserved communities. The whole kind of food desert um, piece, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. Um, a second group of actions are initiative to improve the availability and choice architecture, this kind of like how things are positioned in stores um, of healthier foods. And that generally is in small stores, though not always. And the third are the agricultural marketing initiatives in which you engage farmers and other actors further back in the food system in trying to bring healthy food into communities. And the second two are really focused about removing the unhealthy food in inverted commas. So that's the incentives to reduce or substitute the less healthy foods, uh, generally in food service outlets with healthier foods, healthier foods and healthier ingredients. And then fifth, planning restrictions on food stores and service outlets. So there you have the five main areas of, uh, of policy action, albeit within a fairly small subset. So I'm just, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run through um, some of the actions that have been taken. And forgive me for some of the very crowded slides. And a lot of the examples I'm going to give you are from the United States and, and from the UK. Um, that's where um, I have more information, mainly about the, the United States. Uh, that does reflect some bias in, in where we've been able to find that information, but it does um, also reflect um, where most action is. I, I really should say the United States rather than the, rather than the UK. So this is a great website, healthyfoodaccess.org. If you want to know what's going on in these food action, action initiatives in the United States, go to this website. You'll find pretty much everything. It's an excellent resource. Um, and in the United States, there's around 23 states that have taken uh, finan uh, uh, introduced financial incentive mechanisms for stores to locate in food, what are called food deserts. 
So that, that started in Pennsylvania, that was initiated in 2004, a decade ago, and there's all kinds of things that are going on now. Um, don't expect you to read these in detail, but I really just want to point out that these, the tools that are used around loans, grants, technical support, licensing, a whole range of really what are essentially planning tools that are being used. And these are four particular uh, examples in New Jersey, New York City and California, but you can see um, there's many other states as well. And I just wanted to use this example to highlight that we're not just talking about supermarkets here. We're not just talking about kind of small convenience stores. We're talking about alternative food systems, alternative systems of retail provision. And this is a good example here from New York City, which has got this green cart scheme, which is, as you can see on the picture there, really um, about kind of bringing literally carts into underserved neighborhoods and selling uh, fruits and vegetables on those carts. And there's been a lot of momentum in the United States around this initiative. And Michelle Obama, in her Let's Move campaign, took this on board and talks a lot about the importance of healthy food access in communities. And I don't think it's any coincidence that a few months ago, the Farm Bill, which is the main kind of food and farm bill um, and nutrition bill indeed, in the uh, legislation in the United States, established the Healthy Food Financing Initiative, which is going to inject millions um, into these initiatives around the United States. So then what about healthier food and changing the choice architecture in small stores? Again, examples from the United States. Um, Health on the Shelf, another great resource from Change Lab Solutions. If you're not familiar with Change Lab Solutions, again, I would recommend it. It's an excellent resource which has information about these initiatives as well as a ton of other stuff that goes on in the United States. And uh, this particular resource lists the different initiatives, um, these kind of healthy corner store initiatives that are going on um, in the United States. And as you can see, it's about kind of putting fruits and vegetables in there, but not just fruits and vegetables, it's about whole grain, it's about low fat dairy, it's about nuts, uh, legumes, beans, etc. putting them at the front of the store, and it's about advertising them, and also about introducing nutrition educators in, into the stores um, as well. And we have one of these initiatives in the UK as well, which is part of our Change for Life social marketing campaign, which some of you may be familiar with, which is a government social marketing campaign that has a load of kind of related initiatives. And this again is exactly the same concept. It's about deprived neighborhoods going in, making sure that these local stores have actually got um, fruits and vegetables, et cetera, and advertising it and being proud about it um, to try and encourage greater consumption in these neighborhoods. So the third set of uh, policy actions are agricultural marketing initiatives. I work quite a lot in this area. I could talk for several hours about the different initiatives that are going on around the world. I'm just going to um, give a very brief indication, starting again with the United States. Um, this is just one of the many examples, uh, initiatives in the United States uh, um, to promote uh, kind of local food marketing, marketing direct from farmers to consumers. Um, and it's author these, these things are authorized, are authorized in legislation, and they have a specifically joint goal. Their goal is to increase consumption of healthy fruits and vegetables, etc., but also to develop new market opportunities for farm operations. So, like Australia, the United States has an export-oriented agricultural economy, but it's made a policy decision that it's also going to support its smaller farmers its local farmers, its family farmers, because it's now saying in, in the current administration that it needs to have this diversity in its food system and its food economy, um, and that's going to be beneficial from an economic standpoint. Brazil is exactly the same. Brazil is a massive agricultural economy, huge exports, does very well out of its exports of soy and all kinds of things, but it's also made a decision to support what it so it calls family farmers and the whole load of initiatives that are going on. I just um, picked out one, which is the most recent initiative, which is to um, engage um, the CIAs, as they're called, the whole food, the, whole, uh, the wholesale markets in the promotion of fruits and vegetables with a whole, lo a whole load of supply chain things going on around that. As I said, there's a lot going on in Brazil, which I won't give you in any detail, but it's, it's interesting, interesting stuff. Now, I wanted to give a kind of left field example here which is from Mozambique. So why would I give an example from Mozambique? The reason is, is because this whole, this, there's a whole movement 
around linking agriculture, nutrition and health through the access, increasing access, increasing affordability, increasing acceptability of foods that people need to eat for good health. This is a really a worldwide movement and this is really international development policy. This is funded by USAID and a whole load of international donors and these initiatives are everywhere all over the world including in the case of Mozambique. For example the provision of orange flesh sweet potato which contains high levels of vitamin A um, to farmers to grow to then put into the market and advertise that um, it's vitamin A rich and, and then uh, it leads to um, in, increased, uh, the aim is to, to, to promote consumption. So I really want to just highlight that this whole kind of agriculture, nutrition, health, increasing access is really um, a global phenomenon that is going on in high middle, like, like Brazil, high income countries like the US, middle income countries like Brazil and, and lower income countries like Mozambique. So back to the streets of London. One of the things that we've been trying to do um, in the UK uh, is to create incentives to reduce the kind of less healthy foods and ingredients in food outlets. And there's been a particular focus on um, these kinds of outlets, the, the, the perfect fried chicken type of outlets. Um, and the reason for that is because in a lot of deprived neighbourhoods, people eat takeout, hot takeaway food, from these local businesses, sometimes five times a week. And you can see here that um, you can buy chicken and chips for a, for a pound and it contains 700 calories. And you can get you know, these kinds of pizzas that uh, contain over 1,000 calories. They have energy densities more than double um, what, is, what is recommended. So a real challenge when people are actually consuming this stuff like nearly every day. Um, so, so there's been a, a range of initiatives, um, one of them is in Tower Hamlets and this echoes what's going on in other boroughs and, and places around the UK which is to give restaurants awards um, and kind of a, a sign um, for if they reduce the amount of fat, particularly focused on fat in the foods that they serve. So this is the Food Health Awards from uh, Tower Hamlets which is a pretty a deprived part of London. Uh, here's an example from Liverpool, um, where I lived for a couple of years. Again, and I had um, regular experience of, of going through neighbourhoods and seeing these kinds of takeaways where people were shopping at regularly. This is a bit of a different approach. This is a kind of more stealth approach, which is about providing guidelines. It's a government initiative about providing guidelines to, to, to takeaways and fast food places and saying, you know, it's actually quite easy to reduce the fat. You know, it's, it's not that complicated um, and, and trying to, to encourage them to do it that way without actually telling the consumer. Now, let's go to Singapore. They have got, again, um, uh, uh, this, this approach is called the Healthy Hawker Initiative. And something like 60% of, of, of Singaporeans eat in a hawker stand, and a stand outside, as you can see in the picture here, um, every day. And they have very, these meals have very high levels of saturated fat, which comes from palm oil. So what they've tried to do um, is to decrease the amount of saturated fat and also to increase the, the use of brown rice, whole grain, uh, less salt, uh, lower sugar drinks in the foods that are provided. And they do this with engaging with the suppliers and, and actually what they've done is they've, they've worked with suppliers to manufacture a healthier oil with a healthier, saturated, uh, healthier fatty acid profile and then also created the incentive for the hawkers themselves to advertise this uh, because there's quite a lot of awareness already around the importance of healthy eating in Singapore in order to try and encourage um, uptake. Now, another coming back to London again, another, um, another initiative that has been taken is to say, you know what, forget about the existing stores. They're, they're always going to be there, they're always going to be popular. We need to create some healthy competition with these stores and set up alternative outlets which sell the same food or similar food that is a lot healthier. So this was a pilot study that was again done in a deprived uh, London borough in which school kids go out at lunchtime from their school to these kinds of chicken places and spend a quid on chicken and chips. And they said, you know, if we can get something that is selling much, much healthier food for the same price, uh, you know, we can, um, that's, a, that's a, a way of encouraging a switch, a substitution for healthier alternatives. And of course, another way is just banning, just banning. And that's obviously been the case with trans fats led by New York City in 2006. 
um, that has now been taken up by other cities um, and other parts of um, the United States, including the territory of, of Puerto Rico. I just wanted to, to bring in this example from Mexico because I've never seen this anywhere else. I don't know whether anyone, anyone else has heard of this. But this was the Mexican government as part of it, Less Salt and More Health initiative, where it's a voluntary um, uh, initiative with food service outlets and restaurants in Mexico City that says just take the salt, the salt things off the table, just get rid of them. And indeed I was in Mexico recently and it hasn't in fact been implemented and you can't see uh, salt shakers on tables. So it's just the only example I know of um, from that in particular. Okay, so coming to the end then of this, of this whip round is, is the uh, uh, planning restrictions on food st stores and service outlets. And again, uh, coming from the, the UK, um, the latest summary of uh, what has been done in this area, which was in a report produced in 2013, it's probably been added to a little bit since, is that uh, 21 local plan authorities have some kind of at least attempted or tried to restrict these takeaways, again coming back to this important takeaway culture in the UK, um, as, a, as a means of, of curbing obesity. And you can, uh, there's some details about that on the slide. And then the US, is a, there's a couple of examples. But there's not a whole lot of work done um, in this particular area. Now, if you're anything like me, you'll be looking at those slides and thinking, well, that's, that sounds nice. Well, kind of nice. So what effect have these had? Now, I have to confess that in an earlier version of this presentation, I tediously went through study by study and I, I actually was getting so bored by the end of it <laughs> I decided not to, not to go through every single study but actually to try and pull that evidence together and think about what the elements of success and failure have been. And I think there's a, there's a few things I'd like to highlight, I think there's four together. Where these initiatives have been successful it's because the policy has effectively overcome barriers to meet pent-up demand. So this is the family who wants to eat fruits and vegetables. This is the family who would eat whole grain if only they could get it, if only they could afford it. It's the family who would eat healthier diets if only they were available to them in a way that was acceptable to them. And this, I think, is a good case, the Green Carts Initiative in New, York's, New York. And you'll find there's quite a lot of examples from New York because New York's got quite a lot of money. It's invested a lot in evaluation. It's a good example of how writing things down is a, is a good way of getting things communicated. Um, and, um, and so the, the people in the Green Carts neighborhood were a population um, um, who I haven't actually given the, um, the socioeconomic um, um, data here, but they're a low-income population who worried about not having money. They worried about affordability. They lived in the neighbourhoods, and these green carts were just very, very convenient for them. And, and the customers, they were popular, albeit quite limited in where they were in New York. And, um, and the customers do say that at least from their standpoint, they, they have increased their consumption as, as a result of that. So a clear population that really wanted to access these kinds of foods. Now this means that certain policies are going to affect more groups than others. So this is an example from the Change for Life convenience store uh, 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 initiative which I mentioned earlier. Uh, and the evaluation report, um, is, it makes an interesting read, it came out in 2010. Uh, you really have to kind of read it closely because there were some kind of mixed messages in there and I won't go into that in detail. But you found that from what the report said that the, the greatest increase, the greatest impact of this initiative were among the kind of elderly people who lived in the deprived neighbourhoods who just really couldn't get to the supermarket. And so, and they wanted to buy fruits and vegetables, they wanted to have things that weren't going to go off um, and after sitting around for, for a long time. And so regular access to a closed store really made a difference to them. But of course other groups it really didn't make that much difference at all. And in fact when you look at the sales data, you see that um, the sales data from the, the stores have gone up. But actually, uh, self-reported intake among the groups as a whole didn't really go up that much. Because I think what was happening, it seems like what was happening is that c uh, c customers were simply going to the store instead of going to the supermarket. And so they were switching between the stores, whereas for other populations it was actually having a very important impact on their intake. So that was uh, important that some groups will be affected more than others. 
In other successful examples, you see it's because the policy is a kind of easy win. It provides an acceptable alternative, alternative substitutes for demand. So the demand is there. Those kids want to go and have their chicken and chips or chicken, you know, fast food chicken at lunchtime. And so the evaluation of the, of the box chicken, um, which I showed you earlier in the London Borough of Newham, did indicate successes. I'm not sure, I have to admit, whether it's been rolled out since then, but the pilot was considered successful. You can see from the numbers here that the food was genuinely a lot healthier um, and that they invested. They spoke to their audiences. They went to talk to teenagers and said, you know, what is it that you want? What is it that's going to make a difference to you? What is it that you like? And creating a brand that was popular for young people in order to, to create that competition with all the other chicken outlets. And, and indeed, um, it, was, um, it had an instant popularity um, uh, during the period of the pilot uh, in a really quite a short space of time because the demand was there and it simply s switched it to making it the healthier alternative and the kids liked it and it's the same in the case of trans fats that's an easy switch and so the analysis that has been done on New York City's regulation shows that the trans fats have gone down because they switched to other oils there was an increase in, in saturated fat but as this conclusion emphasizes it's not commensurate so there was a bit of an increase in saturated fat but it wasn't like like for like so it's not ideal but it's better than having the trans fatty acid. So again, that, that is kind of a relatively um, easy win. And then again, this is the example from, from Singapore is written up in this paper. Uh, briefly, the formal evaluation hasn't been conducted yet. But again, you find that, I don't know whether this is because of the symbol or, or not, but I think that can, uh, what I've been told from talking to the people involved is that you know consumers just order off the menu but because the average menu item is healthier that means they're ordering ordering more healthier items so again a kind of an easy substitution not any change in taste no one can taste the difference it's 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 what it's what people want to want to buy moving forward then the third instance where you find success is when the policy creates demand for change and this is where perhaps i'm going to bring in the notion that some of these initiatives haven't worked that well. This is New York City again. New York City started its Healthy Corner initiative um, in, uh, um, several years ago, uh, and it was called the Healthy Bodegas Initiative. Bodegas, if you're familiar with, is a kind of Hispanic term for the, for the corner store, which is um, what, it, what it's known as in, is in New York. And it's changed its program. Why has it changed its program? Because its first program had some good impacts, but it wasn't very widespread. It didn't really make a huge amount of difference. And when I'm, I, I had a meeting with the New York City Department um, a, few, a few months ago, a representative, and I asked her about it, about why they'd changed from Healthy Bodegas to what's now called Shop Healthy NYC. And you might be able to see it says how to adopt a shop. And I asked her if she wouldn't mind, um, uh, uh, last week I asked her would you mind writing it down in an email. So this is directly from her about why she said what she'd learned. And she says the biggest thing we learned from Healthy Bodegas is that you can't create a groundswell if you're working with a few stores in the different areas. And they cannot make the changes if they don't have the customers to demand it. So when you haven't got that pent up demand, it's no good going and saying, you know what we're going to do? We're going to put these lovely fruits and vegetables in the stores. We're going to do this, we're going to do that. And everyone's going to come and everyone's going to love it. It just doesn't work like that. It just doesn't work like that. It does in some circumstances, but not in every circumstance, because life's a bit more complicated than that. And so she talks about we tried all different ways, but we didn't have enough, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then they moved on to this initiative where they thought, you know what? It might not mean that communities are sort of thinking, oh my goodness, there's this wonderful you know, fruits and vegetables in the store now, we're going to go and buy them. Because they're sort of not in the habit of going there. You know? then they're just not really thinking about that. Um, but actually, if we can get customers focused on saying, this is where I want to buy fruits and vegetables, this is a shop that I want to go to, this is part of who I am, this is part of my daily life, and this is really part of our community, then, you know, then it might work. And indeed, they've had a much greater success with this adopt the shop 
where they're encouraging people to actually support shops and there's a whole um, there's a whole um, guides around it which you which you can you can read about and therefore what happened what that meant was we said if 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 the if the if the shops were kind of slacking um, it meant that the customers were complaining they said hang on a minute what's going on i want this stuff from you now so it created a much more sort of sustainable business model and again, I would say, going back to this case from Mozambique, I would say it's the same thing, completely different context. But the process, the principle um, is the same. When you think about it, you're in rural like Mozambique, you're eating white flesh sweet potato, which isn't providing any vitamin A. And you switch to this orange thing, like, what's this orange thing? I mean, you know, people in Mozambique are just like you and me, you know, when you get a new food, you wonder what it is. Um, and there was sort of skepticism around it in the marketplace. But so there's a lot of consumer promotion done to say, you know, this has got vitamin A and it's going to be really good for your children. And women, and women basically care about the nutrition of their children. And so when you make them aware, they're more willing to buy it. But the problem in this case was that the traders, the market people in the middle were reluctant to stock it because oh, I'm not going to make any money. Again, there was a lot of work done to encourage them to sell this product in the market. It's no good producing and getting farmers to produce it if no one's going to sell it. Um, and so they did a whole lot of work around that. And this graph, a bit of technical graph here down on the left, shows that because of the demand, consumers, these are very poor people, were willing to pay more for the orange flesh sweet potato than the white flesh because they knew it was helping the nutrition of their children. And that meant the traders wanted to sell it. They couldn't get there fast enough because they were going to make more money. So um, I've, I've written this, uh, this story up in a, in a report I wrote, which is there on, on the right-hand side. And again, um, this is giving an inkling to the fourth factor for success, which is that the policy has to create incentives and structures to drive and enable changes in supply. This goes back to my previous earlier point this is fundamental to the food economy. This is really about the food system and the, the, the economy that runs the food system. And I've written this up around, I'm giving this example here of the Healthy Hawk Initiative, which I wrote up in a paper in SCN News. And, um, and what was really interesting about what they tried to do in Singapore is that they didn't do, they didn't make some mistakes which we did to make. I have to confess, the Liverpool Initiative is dead didn't work because they just gave out some guidelines and said you know it, it's really easy you just have to sort of lower the fat and you know, it's not that hard you know you're talking a massively resistant population who makes a lot of money out of it what incentive have they got to change absolutely none absolutely none so in Singapore what they did is is they they actually went and they reformulated the oil they did that piece which I already talked about but they spoke to the traders they went to talk to the retailers and the hawkers and said you know why do you want to use this oil and they said no and they said, why didn't you want to use the oil? And they said, because it's more expensive. It's 10% more expensive. And so they said, well, how, how are we going to make it cheaper? So they worked on the logistics of supply. They went back into the food system, into the supply chain, and worked on the logistics of supply. But they also framed it from the perspective of innovation in the food economy. And they got money from a grant that is available um, to um, support projects focused on improving productivity in the food service sector because it was really about them making more money and it's that engagement which is going to create those kind of sustainable and viable business models and create the incentives to participate and this is going to mean that we who work in public health are going to have to accept to a certain extent that this is, has to be driven by an economic imperative now, I found this, this analysis really interesting. This is an evaluation of the placement of the green carts uh, back in, in New York City that came out recently, just uh, a couple of months ago. And it really gave the message that the initiative had been a failure. And the reason it was, we found that green carts were rarely located in food deserts and instead tended to locate near more commercial populated areas with more pedestrian traffic. And this was interpreted as a failure because they weren't physically located in food deserts where nobody walked. Why would anyone want to go to a, a car when they never walked there? 
And so actually, it, it wasn't about like physically kind of getting, you know, getting the map and putting a point in the food desert. It was actually about finding places that are viable where you're going to get your customers because that's where they are and you've got to go to where your customers. You can see here that the reasons for location choice is absolutely clear that uh, you know, the most important reason was that they'd want to locate where people are walking past. Of course they would. And uh, it's, it's good news to see that the green cart vendors, most of them consider themselves very profitable or somewhat profitable. Um, but it's, it's funny because this, this middle bullet point here, it says this choice of location may be reasonable from an economic perspective, as if somehow you know, what's from an economic perspective is not what we with our halos on are concerned about from a nutrition and public health perspective. And I, I, think, that I, you know, I, think, I think that's a mistake. I think we need to be thinking about both. There was a, another example, which I don't give here, the valuation of the convenience store initiative in the UK, which was in another part of the UK and was a very negative evaluation. Um, it was, it was, didn't, didn't go into the details of different populations and things, and there's reasons for that. But it talks about how the health worker who'd been engaged in that initiative resented the fact that it was her job um, to support economic development of the, of the convenience stores because she thought it was nothing to do with her. And, and she found the kind of the fact that the convenience stores were driven by commercial, you know, they're, they're somehow distasteful. Um, because it wasn't just about the purity of, of, of advancing nutrition and health. So you see these interesting um, narratives. So I've already indicated some of the elements um, of uh, failure. And this is perhaps a bit unfair, but just to put it in a, in a simple way. I think the elements of failure are naive assumptions, um, a lot of naive assumptions about what it takes for a viable business model, what it takes for time needed to work, and the nature of demand. Um, if any of you know this literature, and if any of you go on afterwards and start to do a dig around this literature, um, I cannot pretend that you will not find examples of failure, because you will. And so this is one example that I like to give from Mark Winnie's book. I don't know whether you're familiar with this book, but I recommend that you all read it. It's a superb book written by a community food activist who is absolutely pro community food systems, changing the retail model, the lot. And um, I think he may have been over here to, to Australia quite a, a couple of years ago. And he writes in his book about the problem with not understanding what a viable business model is. And I, I, I just had to read this because it kind of moved me to tears when I first read this book um, some years ago. And he's talking, and the chapter is entitled Restoring America's Food Deserts. And he's talking about an initiative designed to get a store or a supermarket into one of these kind of devastated food deserts back in the 1980s. And Mark at the time was working in Hartford, Connecticut, in a very poor area, um, trying to kind of um, spearhead these community food initiatives. And this is what he says. He says, and I hope I don't start crying because it's very sad, um, the bands were playing and the people were dancing on Hartford's Farmington Avenue one beautiful September day in 1985. The reason for this public display of merriment was the opening of a brand new supermarket with the name Our Store, a cooperative that was owned by 1,200 neighborhood residents who'd each invested $50 of their own money, which is a lot. Move forward. In 1987, almost 19 months after the band stopped playing and the members put away their dancing shoes, the Our Store Co-op closed its doors and covered its windows with plywood. As well-intentioned as the effort was, the enthusiasm and good vibrations were not enough to overcome the harsh realities of a marketplace that demanded 60,000 square foot superstores crammed full of every item under the sun. But more importantly, the people who had been involved and initiated it were social entrepreneurs who knew how to organize people and resources, but they hadn't been brought up in the rough and tumble world of food retailing. And Mark goes on to talk about the mistakes that they made around not understanding about the need to secure enough capital, the not understanding about who you need to hire and the kind of skills that you need. So, a very important lesson there. And, I, and I'm always happy to talk about that particular example because I know it's written by someone who is so incredibly in favor of these types of initiatives and understands the harsh realities. In other words, he's not a cynic. 
Now the other assumption which is really important is, is around this, this idea that these are going to have an immediate effect. I gave some examples, the, the box chicken example, the green cart example, where you're going to get this immediate response and, there's, and, the, and that's because you're meeting pent, uh, an unmet, pent, uh, pent up, unmet demand and you're doing an easy substitute for something else. But in a lot of cases, you know, people are just in their habits. Some people aren't going to like, they're not used to, to having fruits and vegetables in their neighbourhood. It takes time to change. And so this was an um, uh, analysis that came out of the Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania Food Finance, Finance Initiative, as I pointed out earlier, the first such financing initiative where Mich Michelle Obama seems to visit every couple of months. It's now um, ended, it's been replaced by something else. Um, but there was an evaluation done on this that came out in the journal Health Affairs um, um, this year. And I don't need to, to read uh, anything more but the title. New neighbourhood grocery store increased awareness of food access but did not alter diet habits or, or obesity. And so of course the media, who, uh, the kind of right wing media frankly, uh, such as this website here, um, kind of went crazy about it saying again this is an example we don't want government intervention blah de, blah de, blah studies undermine michelle obama's food deserts campaign and this is a, an excerpt from the article that was online that came out in the media flowy that came out after this report came out and this is six months after the supermarkets were built the researchers found only 26 percent of those who lived near one of the newly built grocery stores ended up using it and within that 26 percent there was no significant improvement in body mass index six months i mean please you know, this is, you know this, this is problematic when, as I said, some of them are going to have an instant effect. But these things need time to work. Now, there may be other issues. I, I have not visited. I have been, and I, have, I, I do know the people who work at the Food Trust who were engaged with, with this in Pennsylvania. That was uh, several years ago. I haven't been since. So you know, I don't know the story, and I won't pretend that I do. And there may have been other kinds of issues that are going on. Maybe the fact that it was a supermarket rather than a smaller place, maybe it wasn't where foot traffic was. Could have been a whole load of reasons why, and maybe it wasn't the right vehicle. Um, but nevertheless, these results are unfortunately interpreted to say, you know, it's just a complete failure um, after such a, a small amount of time. And so I think this is an important lesson for policy evaluation and indeed for communication, the results um, of our work. So um, the, um, the final one is about naive assumptions about the nature of demand. And I, I wanted to, to, to talk about this a bit more and, and give this as the example. This year, um, a paper came out um, which was of one of these healthy cor corner store initiatives on the purchase of urban low-income youth and it concludes that the corner store initiative did not result it had a load of things around it trying to again things I've talked about trying to get fruits and vegetables whole grain and so on um, did not result in significant changes uh, in the energy content of corner store purchases um, or in uh, categorical me measures of obesity which I've already discussed and it said these data will help inform future interventions and I think that's a, a quite an appropriate conclusion. But I wanted to, to, to draw out some of the discussion points that were made and the first one um, is, uh, this is a direct quote, it's possible that the fourth, fifth and sixth graders were not the primary demographic purchasing fruit salad, sorry to laugh, <laughs> it's kind of a no-brainer. Um, no they weren't. So it's not really surprising. Um, it's possible that the students were not motivated to make healthy choices when the less expensive, highly passable items were still readily available. No, you wouldn't expect that. But this is where we begin to get something else coming in here. It says, due to the challenges in working with the national snack distributors, space that was allocated specifically for healthy items were difficult to maintain. In other words, um, the, the retailers didn't have any incentive, they didn't have that kind of viable business model because the snack and the soft drink companies were kind of forcing them essentially to give them, you know, to give the optimum location because of the contracts that they have and all the incentives that they, um, they get from them. And so this means it leads me really to, to the next point, which is to say, let's think at these urban low income youth in the United States. They have been targeted by these companies with the, who, who were doing these contracts ever since they were born, before they were born whether it be marketing, whether it be getting to their parents in various ways or their caregivers in very, various ways due to the incentive around the cost environment and lots and lots and lots of ways that this group is being targeted at from birth and in fact before birth. So by the time they're in the fourth and fifth and sixth grade, 
it's no wonder that they want to eat beverage, chips and candy. And that's what I understand about understanding the nature of demand. That demand has been created. We know, and it comes back to, to the point I made earlier, we know that exposure to these kinds of foods throughout the live course increases our preferences for these foods. And it's why, and it's one of the benefits uh, that I always find of having, kind of going from country to country, is seeing that, you know, you go from one country to the next and people eat different stuff because they're used to it. It's the norms, it's the culture, and it's often, in this cr um, case, created um, by the actions of food companies instilling these kinds of demands in people. So I just want to end then giving some uh, brief lessons learned. I, I just really want to make a quick point about policy. Some of you might be looking at this and thinking, these are just initiatives. But actually, they are policy. And the reason is, is that when you look at the tools that are being used, um, they are tools that are used to make markets work. If you look at the telecommunications industry, the financial services industry, just pick an industry. Governments have a role in making those markets work, the food industry indeed, and they use a range of different tools to do that. And when you look at the kind of different tools that have been used, it's about funding and technical support, about financial incentives, licensing, voluntary standards, product specific restrictions. All of these things are used in other industries to, to make markets work. It's not so much about regulation, it's about having a well-functioning economy. Not that, that we've doing very well with that in recent years, and I, I think that our food economy is reflective of our, our mismanagement of the economy much more broadly. So I think when, when the, to answer the question, how can policy support the provision of healthy diets in <coughs> communities, it's really about making these alternative food markets work. And that means that policies are going to work if they are tailored to the nature of demand, including demand creation in the community, and um, they create incentives uh, for viable alternative business models. I just want to make a quick point about policy evaluation, because I hope it's come through that um, this is just yet another example of how, when we are putting, evaluating policy, that we really need to look at the effects on different groups, because we can't imagine that these policies are going to affect all the same uh, groups in the same ways. We need to look at effects over time rather than just leaving things for six months. I know this is all very challenging, nevertheless it's important, but we also need to start working with others to build an evaluation of how it affects those economic actors in the food system. So, last couple of slides, I would argue that a healthy food provision policy is a policy which makes markets work for healthy diets, it's about markets, it's about the economy, and therefore it's about creating those incentives and structures that enable the food system actions, um, actors to have those business models. It's very important to engage with communities. It's, it's, it's no good going in and thinking that we know what communities want. We really have to understand the different contexts, and there are going to be different solutions in different places, uh, and understand and engage with the people communities that we want to move towards healthier eating. And we have to address the total diet. This is not just about enhancing you know, the fruits and vegetables side. It's also about affecting the, the kind of eat less, the less healthy foods. And I would argue it, it's not just about making healthier choices, the easy choice. I, I started off with that. It's used a lot. This terminology is used all over the world about making healthy choices, the easy choice. But it's really making about it the preferred choices, the choices that people actually want, because that's what's going to sustain change, uh, which means tackling unhealthy demand creation from the start of life. So the three pro uh, top priorities then are to our policies uh, to create economic opportunities for alternative actors in the food systems, the farmers, the, the small stores and so on, involved in the provision of healthy foods to meet and create local demand. I think that's pretty much a no-brainer, in fact. The easy substitutions is also something that can work um, relatively easy, easily. Uh, what's a bit harder is addressing the eat less foods. And it, it may not seem to you, or, or pro probably does hopefully now, but it may not seem to the outside world that when you're talking about healthy retailing, you're starting to talking about policies on advertising to kids and policies that target very young children. But actually policies that are going to help young children grow up in a healthy food environment are a fundamental part of this policy area because when they get to 14, they're going to be, and they're surrounded by an unhealthy learning environment, they're going to be demanding this food and they're going to be making these interventions really in policies really, really hard to implement. So we really must address 
uh, the eat less food um, part of the equation uh, as well. Thank you. very much Karina for a, a global thought provoking a well balanced overview of some of these successful and less than successful uh, policies and initiatives from around the world I think that's terrific